even in our secular age, a religion is still alive and well. And there are some aspects of religion that even the secular world admires and praises. I was reminded of this recently when Pope Francis was named by Time Magazine as the Person of the Year for 2013, mostly because of his compassion for the poor and his willingness to seek change within the Catholic Church, uh, Pope Francis has been praised even by the secular media. Even the secular world admires religious people who take a stand on those issues deemed important by today's cultural elites. So if you say the right things and do the right things, uh, even the world will acknowledge religious people for, for doing certain kinds of things and saying certain kinds of things. So even today, even in this, um, this age that some people have called the post-Christian era, yeah. even today there are still people who will admire religious works. Now Jesus was born into a much different culture from ours. The culture into which Jesus was born would make ours seem pagan by comparison. Most of the things that Jesus taught and said were said to people who were deeply religious. These were people who had been formed not only by the law of Moses, but by an organized and formalized system of traditions. The infamous Pharisees represent one tributary of this religious stream and this religious tradition, the fountainhead of which can be traced back to the time between the Old and the New Testaments. But Jesus found that religious system, with all of its traditions, to be a corruption of the Word of God that had originally come to Israel through Moses. And you will soon discover even after a brief exposure to the Word of God, that what impresses men and what pleases God are not one and the same. The official religious establishment of Israel did not love God. They did not know God at all. Their religion was entirely for self-aggrandizement. The religious elites were emphasizing only what was convenient for them or what made them look good to the people instead of actually doing the things that God had commanded and that were important to God. These religious leaders of Israel had become proud, they were self-righteous, and they were completely alienated from the very God they claimed to represent and to worship. And so in Matthew 23, Jesus is showing his disciples how to avoid the folly of these religious men, the folly that was leading them directly to hell. Yeah. Now, if we examine the larger context of Matthew 23, we begin to see that our text is actually part of a much larger section devoted to Jesus pronouncing judgment and condemnation on the religious establishment of Israel at that time. And I think it's very difficult for Americans to understand the context in which Jesus spoke these words of judgment. It's difficult for Americans because Americans don't take religion very seriously. The Jews did. The Jews took their religion very seriously, enough so that they wanted Jesus dead when he spoke against their religious system. Jesus could not endorse Judaism as it had developed because the religious leaders had corrupted the original law of Moses by adding to it a layer of traditions and rabbinical interpretations and commentaries. Jesus made it clear what he thought about these additions when he told them, you have nullified the word of God for the sake of your traditions. Jesus' final condemnation of the Jewish religious establishment began when he came into the city of Jerusalem for the final time. This is an event that we remember as the triumphal entry. <clears throat> That's in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus' first order of business when he came into the city, the first thing he did 
is he cleaned out the temple. He made a whip of cords. He drove out the animals. He overturned the tables of the money changers. This was a bold act. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a picture of God's judgment on that corrupt religious system. Right after he cleaned out the temple, Jesus went outside the city with his disciples. He saw a fig tree. He went over to the fig tree, and it didn't have any fruit, even though it had a lot of green leaves. And Jesus cursed that fig tree, and it withered. This was another picture of God's judgment on that religious system of the Jews. God was looking for spiritual fruit, and he found nothing but leaves. Now, you can probably anticipate what happened next to Jesus. He was attacked by the religious leaders who were trying to trap him and discredit him by something he might say. This is in chapter 21 uh, and in, on into chapter 22 of Matthew. There were several different groups or parties of religious leaders in that system, and they all take their turns attacking Jesus, trying to trap him in something that he might say with what they thought were really tricky issues and difficult questions. And Jesus, nothing works. Jesus just sweeps it all aside, and then he counterattacks. He spoke in parables about the religious leaders and their rejection of God, their rejection of God's kingdom and their rejection of God's messengers that he had sent. Jesus also then turns and asks them a question that they cannot answer concerning the true identity of the Christ, and he silences them for good. And then chapter 23 begins our text. He turns to his disciples to warn them about the danger of following in the footsteps of these corrupt religious leaders. This chapter includes a diatribe against the leaders of Israel, which culminates in seven woes. Seven woes against the religious leaders. A woe is like a warning of impending doom. That judgment is going to come, judgment's going to fall. Now, Israel actually had a history of rejecting God's messengers that he had sent to them. And now, now, they were rejecting the very Son of God himself. Jesus then, at the end of this section, laments the sad spiritual state of Jerusalem. And in the next chapter, chapter 24, he foretells its destruction. Now, Jesus' words in this section should not be taken to be a condemnation of all the Jewish people everywhere and for all times. Jesus' words are directed at the religious leaders of that particular generation. Not all of the Jews rejected Jesus, and God has certainly not written off the Jewish people and replaced them with the church, as some have taught. Uh, and you can read Paul's argument about that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. One important lesson that we learn from this section is that there is perhaps no sin that arouses God's wrath like religious hypocrisy. And the church needs to take this to heart, and that is probably why this section of Scripture was preserved for us. We should not think that we are safe from God's wrath if we transgress like the religious leaders of Israel. Now, lurking behind the scenes of this entire context is the death of Jesus. He came back to Jerusalem to die. And behind the scenes are lurking the secret murderous plots of these very religious leaders. It's a little disturbing to me to think about, about the fact that the people who most hated Jesus, the people who wanted him dead and were actually responsible for handing him over to the Romans, they were the most religious people. Why is that the case? Shouldn't they, shouldn't they have been the ones to have welcomed Jesus, the Christ, and recognized him as the Messiah, but they didn't? Jesus was a threat to their power, his, and they were jealous of his, population, of his popularity with the people who flocked to hear him. Pilate even knew that it was out of envy that they handed him over to them. That's Matthew 27, 18. Even this, this Roman governor, governor could tell what was really happening. Remember that these men 
were men who claimed to be close to God, who claimed to represent God, who claimed to know God and speak for God, but they hated the Son of God. It's, it's really an incredible thing to think about. Their true feelings about God were exposed by Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Light exposes what is hidden in the darkness, and Jesus exposed these religious leaders for what they really were. Their hatred of Jesus shows that even though they knew about the true God, they were experts in the scriptures, but they did not really love God, and they did not really know the living God at all. Now, I think that sometimes Christians love to read these passages about Jesus versus the Pharisees because we like to put ourselves on Jesus' side over and against the Pharisees. You see, because if we had been alive back then, we would have been on the right side. No, no doubts about that at all. And so, in other words, we, when we read passages like this, we always assume our moral superiority. Just remember... If moral superiority had anything to do with entering the kingdom of God, the Pharisees would have gotten in, and they probably would have outdone all of us. That's right. And so we can easily miss the point of passages like this. Yes. The point of this passage is not so that we can condemn the Pharisees. Jesus already did that for us. The point is, is that we can look at our own hearts and make sure there is nothing in our hearts resembling what Jesus condemned here in this Amen. passage. Jesus sounds like a prophet in this passage. He sounds like a Isaiah or Jeremiah or Amos. Or maybe I should say they sounded like Jesus because he's the word. But Jesus is standing firmly planted in that whole prophetic tradition of Israel because the prophets had always condemned the people for their religious hypocrisy. So Jesus isn't saying anything new, and the sin that they're committing is not something new. We need to take note of what makes God angry. Take note of that. Jesus got angry with the religious leaders. Jesus did not get angry with the Samaritan woman. Remember, she had five husbands, and the man she now had was not her husband. But Jesus didn't get angry with her. Jesus didn't get mad at the woman caught in the very act of adultery. Jesus didn't get angry. The prostitutes, the tax collectors, other sinners were entering the kingdom of God ahead of the religious leaders because those who know they are sinners are ready for a Savior. From this viewpoint, the worst possible sin, the sin that makes you irredeemable, is pride and self-righteousness. Religious sin is much more serious than the sins of the flesh. What God really wants from us is honesty and truthfulness instead of pretense. Our righteousness, Jesus said, must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Amen. You see, it was God's intention to make a new covenant, to write his law on our hearts. And that's why Jesus told a Pharisee, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is needed is the total renovation of the human heart. Now, when we read the Gospels, we need to remember that when we see Jesus and when we hear Jesus, we are seeing and hearing God. This is God in the flesh. Amen. Jesus is God in human flesh, and so when Jesus speaks, when Jesus acts, or when Jesus reacts, we are seeing the nature of God displayed through a human personality. The incarnation, or God becoming flesh, is what separates Christianity from all other religions and all other philosophies out there in the world. The God revealed in Jesus is up close and personal for everyone to see, perhaps too close for our comfort sometimes, certainly too close for their comfort. In Jesus' condemnation of this religious system of the Jews, we're seeing something about God. We're learning something about the nature of God. Obviously, we see his wrath, God's anger. Wrath is his righteous indignation. God is opposed to evil, always. Amen. He's opposed to sin. 
to wickedness, to anything, he is opposed to anything that is at variance with his own nature. That's wrath. God is never neutral about evil, and we should be glad about that. We should be glad that God is not some kind of passive observer of human, the human race. God is not. But we also see in Jesus the compassion of God. Even in a text that thunders forth in judgment, we see the compassion of God and the compassion of Jesus. You see, just after Jesus pronounces doom on the religious system in Jerusalem, he then breaks down and laments the awful fate of the city or the people that God loved. Wrath and compassion being displayed simultaneously by the Son of God. Now, compassion is a feeling. The original Greek word literally means to feel something down in your guts. It's a feeling of pity or of sorrow for someone who's hurting or someone who is in dire straits and in need. The Gospels are constantly showing us the compassion of Jesus particularly those compa- compassion for those who are sick. It says he, a leper would come to Jesus. It says he, would, he felt compassion for them. And it says one time he looked, he saw the crowds that were coming towards him, and he, it says he has compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The attributes of wrath and compassion both belong to God's nature. And they are without, they are without conflict, They do not cancel each other out. God is capable of wrath and compassion at the same time. In fact, if we add wrath and compassion, what it equals is jealousy. The scripture says God is a jealous God. That's one of the primary revelations of the law of Moses. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. He said, He said, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make for yourself an idol and bow down because the Lord your God is a jealous God. God. God is jealous for his covenant people. He becomes filled with both wrath and compassion when his people turn away from him to other lovers. You see, wrath is not the opposite of love. The opposite of love is indifference. And love does not equal tolerance. This is what many people today do not understand who object to God's wrath or jealousy. I know the idea of jealousy makes many people uncomfortable because they think of God as some kind of selfish, manipulative man who just wants to be in control. That's why we hear things like, you shouldn't be jealous, you know, because that conjures up images of somebody who's just manipulative, someone who's trying to control some other person. And so a lot of people would object very strongly to the idea that God is a jealous God. But just remember, God's not a man, God is not a man. God is the creator. And he has a right to lay claim on his creatures. He has a right to our affections. God is not being selfish because we add nothing to him. He he doesn't need us at all, but we need him. His love is our highest good. And when we reject him, we are choosing death. That's the only other alternative to God. And God does not want us to die. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He said one time to the people of Israel, he says, I set before you life and death. Choose life. He pleads with the people through Moses. Why would you die, O house of Israel? Choose life. There's some passion in that. There's some some compassion in that. God often compared himself to a husband who was jealous for his wife, Israel. But Israel was unfaithful to her husband and broke the covenant. Remember Hosea's wife? God said, I want you to know, Hosea, Hosea, before you can speak for me, you got to know exactly how I feel, and I'll go take a wife who's a harlot. And he did. He married a woman named Gomer, and of course she was a harlot, so she went a-whoring. And God said, you go buy her back and love her. Because that's how I feel about my people. God loved Israel and they ran away after other lovers. Now, are, are we to expect God not to be moved by this unfaithfulness? 
do, do we think of God as some cold, hard judge on a bench who is just, just going by the letter of the law? And so God just says, well, you broke the law, guilty, and just has cold, hard, no feeling, totally, totally uh, separate, clinical. That's not God. That's not God. You see, I'm not sure that people really want God to love them. They don't really understand what that means. What they really want is for God to leave them alone. But love can't leave us alone. The lover pursues the beloved. I have a certain jealousy for my wife because I love her. And I want her to be with me and I want her to love me back. The marriage covenant itself is a picture of God and his people, of Christ and his bride. Now, when you invest in a relationship, you do expect some reciprocity. You expect that if you invest in this relationship, that person is going to also invest in the relationship. And God is no different. When he invests in his people, he expects a return on that investment. And so when God becomes angry with his people, God's wrath is not because God hates his people. It's because precisely because he loves them. And he seeks their highest good. And he is filled with compassion or grief when they reject him and they die as a result. I'm not saying that God is, God is so compassionate that he wouldn't punish. That's not what I'm saying at all. That can't be proven from scripture. But God has both wrath and compassion in his nature. It's actually the nature of God that powers salvation. In salvation, we see wrath and compassion. There are numerous examples of this throughout the scripture. We see it at the very beginning. After the man and his wife had sinned and they stood before the Lord, they were made to face their sin and were kept from the tree of life, cast out of Eden. Yet, God made coverings for them. He gave them a promise that the serpent's head would eventually be bruised. So we see wrath and compassion. Later, God was grieved in his heart, which is a feeling similar to compassion. Because of the wickedness of mankind, he determined to destroy mankind. That's an expression of wrath. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and the human race was not exterminated. Wrath and compassion. God came down to confuse the language of the people at the building of Babel. That's wrath. Yet immediately after he scattered the people, he called Abram out of Ur and gave him a promise of blessing for the world. There's compassion. The ultimate meeting of God's wrath and God's compassion was seen at the cross. Amen. Where God provided atonement or a covering for sinners. So without God's wrath and compassion, there wouldn't be any salvation for us. That's why those people who want to remove the wrath of God are actually making God less loving, not more loving. It is God's love that moved him to provide a propitiation for his own wrath. So in a sense, God is saving us from himself. His love propitiates his wrath and allows him to accept us because of what Jesus did on the cross. This is why unless we accept the biblical revelation of God, we will end up and we are in constant danger of creating a God in our own image. We will either create, people will either create a God who's soft and tolerant or a God who's harsh and angry. Now understand that God is making a people for himself who know him and who represent him and actually... Uh, to some degree, experience his own nature, his own character. In other words, we are to feel what God feels. That's what, that's what God wants for his people. He wants us to feel like he feels about things, both wrath and compassion. In other words, we're to be like Jesus. That's God's purpose, is to conform us into the image of Christ. Now, when Jesus looked at Jerusalem and he saw that corrupt religious system, he felt both wrath and compassion, and we should also have this complex response to the sin and error of people. 
Sometimes I think we're too simple. We only have one gear in our emotional transmission. And so we feel either wrath or compassion, but not both at the same time. And so we easily get out of balance. Some of you are naturally compassionate people. And you feel nothing but compassion for people. And because of this, you're too soft. You tolerate too much. You fail to say the hard words that need to be said. On the other hand, some of you are all wrath and anger. You're like the prophet Jonah. You remember Jonah got mad because God wouldn't condemn Nineveh? Jonah came there to see Nineveh burn. And that's what he wanted to see. He didn't want to go there at all. But when he was there, he at least wanted to see some fireworks. He wanted to see some brimstone and some sulfur rain down on Nineveh there. He wanted him French fried. It's like, when, it's like when they went to Samaria. I was just reading this the other night when Jesus went with his disciples. He was going to Jerusalem. He was going to go through Samaria. And the Samaritans wouldn't let him pass because he had his face set towards Jerusalem. And J James and John, the sons of thunder, said, Lord, let's call down fire on them. Jesus said, what spirit are you of? I didn't come to destroy life. I came to save it. But see, we can be sons of thunder like that. You know, We, we want to see God judge people. Instead of being like Jonah, we should be like Paul, who when he came to the city of Athens, it says he was distressed when he saw that Athens was filled with idols. And that word does not mean that Paul just got mad. It was a much more complex emotional response. It means something like he was filled with concern or he was, he was filled with jealousy even, just like God is filled with jealousy. He was concerned for the people who were being ruined by the idols that they worshipped. That bothered Paul, that people would be ruining themselves by worshipping idols. We must represent God accurately, feeling both wrath and compassion for those who are going astray. If we don't feel these things, then we are really not ready to speak for God or to serve God or to minister because we are nothing like Jesus. Now, if Jesus had not come, there is a very good chance that many of us would be just like the Pharisees, and we would fall under the same condemnation. And so Jesus wants to save us from religion. I should say it this way. Jesus wants to save us from corrupt religion. Because I, say, I say that because not all religion in and of itself is not necessarily evil. There is a religion that is pure. But religion can be false, it can be corrupted, and that is what Jesus is condemning here in our text. The Jews actually had the only revealed religion in history, and they, cor and they managed to corrupt it. Now this, and, and I don't have any doubt that the church has done the same thing with the gospel, which is even more serious than what the Jews did to the law. And we learn from this that human nature can corrupt anything, anything. Our religion must be pure, untainted by the flesh, and Jesus is the only one who can save us from our flesh. Which, and what Jesus is really doing, in a sense, I said a minute ago, Jesus, in a sense, is saving us from God, from God's wrath. In another sense, Jesus is saving you from yourself, Amen. from your own flesh. As long as your flesh dominates your life, everything you do, including your religion, will be corrupt and will be unacceptable to God. Paul said in Romans 8, verse 8, those in the flesh cannot please God. I would add to that, even if they're religious. You see, there is something we are missing that no religion can give us. Religious people still need Jesus. Amen. There's an excellent illustration of this way back in the old scriptures. Cain is a picture of the kind of religious man that God will not accept. Cain was going through the motions of religion and offering something to God, just like his brother Abel. But Abel's accepted, and Cain is rejected. And, and biblical commentators have asked the question for centuries, why? Why did God accept Cain and or accept Abel, excuse me, and reject Cain? I've, I've, I've read some commentators that, that philosophize and say, well, maybe it's because, 
You know, Abel, he offered a lamb, and that's a picture of the offerings of the, sa of the, the sacrifices of atonement and the lamb of God, Jesus himself, while as Cain brought some of his crops, you know. But actually, under the law, God commanded them to offer animals and some of their produce from their crops. I, I don't think that's what was going on there. In fact, I don't think there was a problem with Cain's offering per se. There was a problem with Cain. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. It is the man who makes the offering acceptable, not the offering that makes the man acceptable. And that is extremely difficult to get across to religious people. We are trained as religious people to think about, we think in terms of being right and doing the right things. That's how we think as religious people. We have to learn to think differently. God does not simply want our sacrifices and offerings. In fact, Israel's sacrifices were rejected by God, even though they technically brought the correct offerings. That's Amos 5, verse 22. He says, I hate your sacrifices and the noise of your songs. I will not accept them. We are to, you see, that was the people that were not acceptable, so neither was their religion. So we, we need to understand this. Uh, religion doesn't make up for a bad heart Amen. in the presence of God. It doesn't. A good heart can offer an acceptable offering of worship. But a bad heart doesn't matter what you do. See? It, it, the Bible, does, when Cain brought his offering, the Bible, does, God didn't say, now, now Cain, the problem is, is with your offering. The Bible doesn't say that. And I hope you see the, the connection here. Abel is Jesus. The religious leaders are Cain. The people were not acceptable, so neither was their religion. It says we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service. God is not just looking for a certain kind of worship <coughs> or a certain kind of religion. God is looking for a certain kind of worshiper. That's John 4.23. We tend to be far too impressed by the external act of worship, but God looks at the heart. God is not impressed by what pleases men. Jesus came to change our hearts so that we would be acceptable to God. And when we are acceptable to God, then our worship or our religion will also be acceptable to God. Again, that's a very difficult principle for religious people to get in their minds. But it's true. The problem is our self-centered focus. And from this self-centeredness comes the hideous sin of pride. And religious pride is perhaps the worst kind of pride. The pride of religion is self-righteousness and the smug, self-satisfied feeling of moral superiority. But you notice, as you read the Gospels, that anyone who really saw who Jesus was became instantly humble, even afraid. There was that time that Jesus told Peter, throw your nets down. And Peter said, well, we've been fishing. He said, Lord, you're a carpenter. I'm the fisherman. We've been fishing. We haven't caught anything. But because you said so, well, I'll do it. And he caught this great catch of fish. It says, Peter came up to the Lord and he fell down on his knees and he said, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Amen. Now, Matt, imagine that uh, you are an accomplished singer. And uh, you even enter singing competitions. And every singing competition you enter, you win. And perhaps you've bis just been crowned the best singer in Joplin, Missouri. You've won the contest. And so you decide that you're such a good singer. Obviously, you must be good because you're the best singer in Joplin. So you're going to take your talents to the Big Apple, to New York City, and you're going to sing on Broadway. And so you go to Broadway. Now, what's going to happen to your self-image when you arrive in New York City on Broadway? You know what's going to happen? You are going to be humbled. Because you may have been good in Joplin, but in, on Broadway in New York City, 
everybody's good. That's why they're in New York City. You see, of course, you can always comfort yourself by saying, well, at least I was the best singer in Joplin. We can always make ourselves feel superior by comparing ourselves to some poor slob who is a moral failure. But what happens to our self-confidence when we look at Jesus? What if you look at the righteousness of Christ? What happens then? You see, the key to true humility is neither to praise yourself nor to debase yourself, but not to look at yourself at all. To look only at Jesus. We cannot be proud when we look at the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. You remember why Jesus came to Jerusalem in the first place in this passage? It was to lay down his life. To offer himself as a sacrifice for sinners. And when Jesus got there to the city, he encountered this proud, self-righteous religious institution. So there is this intentional contrast in the scriptures between Jesus, who's going to humbly offer himself, and the pride of the Pharisees, who thought only about themselves. The cross is God's final judgment on all human pride, religion, and self-righteousness. All of our efforts to justify ourselves before God through our religion are judged by the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way, if, if the law could have justified us, then Christ died for nothing. If we could have established our own righteousness by being religious, the law would have done the job. And Jesus would never have had to have come to offer himself. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, and that's referring to humility, you will never enter the kingdom. Pride is not something we can bring with us into the kingdom and work on it later like a bad habit. Pride excludes you from entering at all. It not only alienates us from God, I'm talking about pride. Pride not only alienates us from God, it alienates us from each other. Religious pride is expressed in a feeling of superiority. It causes rivalry, judgmental, harsh attitudes, competition, contention, and division. We attack other people because we feel free to do so because we feel superior to them. But Jesus is setting a new standard for our relationships with one another. He's talking to his disciples in this passage. He says, you're not to be like the Pharisees. They exalt themselves over each other is the idea. They try, they're in competition with each other. Who can be the holiest? They're looking for position and, and trying to get the higher position. The disciples had actually done this too. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus had to quell an argument because they were arguing about who was the greatest. They actually did that at the Last Supper. They were arguing about which one was the greatest. Uh, two of them got their mom involved. You know, you get your mom to ask Jesus a favor. Let my two boys sit on your right and on your left. And Jesus, that's when Jesus called a little child. And he said, if you want to you be great, you've got to be like this little child. Here's the law of the kingdom. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled by God. In other words, if you exalt yourself, you make yourself a target for the wrath of God. Those who humble themselves will be exalted by God. This is a universal law of the kingdom of God. It's just as dependable, just as predictable, just as reliable as the law of gravity itself. Exalt yourself, humbled by God. Humble yourself, exalted by God. Now, keeping pride from rising up within us is a constant battle. Pride is it's a subtle sin, and it can be well concealed behind a religious mask. Pride is not so obvious like the sins of the flesh. And maintaining humility is something like trying to hold a wet bar of soap. But we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we are not modern-day Pharisees. That's why this passage is in the Bible. Jesus makes it clear that if we are like the religious leaders, there is no way we can be saved. 
There is no way we will escape being condemned to hell. So now you know how God feels about corrupt religion. Our exhorter is going to be Brother Jeremy.